Hi everyone. Um, thanks for making the time today. Uh, my name is Ahmed Oshahi. I work at Google. I'm a product manager in the G Suite product, uh, which if you're not familiar with it, is the Sheets, Docs, Slides, the collection of productivity tools. I um, want to get one thing out of the way. I'm not here to represent Google. What I'm saying is completely my opinion. Uh, does not represent the company by any way, shape, or form, right? Um, I'll try my best to make this not be a waste of your time. Um, I'll also try to be quick because I think, you know, I don't want to be mumbling the slides here. I think there's more value in the discussion. So I'll try to go through the deck, hopefully explain what I can, uh, and then we end up in a discussion and any questions you guys can have and hopefully I can answer. Um, also, that the last thing I want to say is I tried to make this presentation and discussion today not to be about the product management tools and what you need to do in each tool or each step in the process, right? Because I think there is a lot of this online, um, but I'll be happy to talk about this in the Q&A at the end. I tried to make this be more of the kind of the realities and practicalities of the job and the challenges that people face in it, uh, so that you know what to expect. Um, and hopefully that can help you be ready when, when you get into it or if you're into it already. Um, so before I start, just maybe it can help to understand the, the background. So, in this room, how many people come or are in engineering roles or an engineering background? Okay, so the majority. Uh, what about the rest? Uh, marketing, sales, finance? Okay. Sorry? Great. Um, okay, so I think, I think what I have here will, be, will fit well with, with, the, with the demographics of the room. Um, so let's start. Just I want to set one thing straight, right? Because yeah, you read about product management. When I started, everybody tells you you're the CEO of the product. The fact is you're not. Like let's just put this fact, you know, straight. You're not. You're not the CEO of any kind, right? Like you're basically the the shepherd of the product. Like you're you're the one that tries to argue left and right with everybody so that we can make a good decision about the product. Um, and I, th I think I'd, I'd like to use an example here, right? Um, anybody here works at Fitbit? Are everybody familiar with Fitbit? Okay. So let's, I want to make this a little bit more interactive, right? So let's say you are a product manager in Fitbit, right? Um, you're coming up with a new product. Let's say actually you have come up with a new product, right? And this product is going to kick ass. It's going to be a great product. It's going to sell left and right. You want to launch this product, so you already went through all the difficulties of designing what the product is, working with people to develop it, and you have it. You just want to go sell it, right? What do you think is going to happen now? Like, who do you need to work with in your own company so that you can go out and make this product sell and have it be successful? Just anybody who volunteers. Marketing and sales. Right. So marketing and sales, right? Um, so you're going to work on marketing, marketing to say, okay, so these are the materials that we want to push out. These are the messages that we want to push. This is why this product is better than the others. This is why I need your help, right? This is how I suggest we price it versus other products. Um, this is why we're better than competitors. This is what you need to go equip the sales team with. These are the selling materials that you have to go train the sales people to sell, right? All of these things are things you want to work with marketing on. Problem is, like every other function, they don't usually have the bandwidth for you, right? So you gotta make your point and make your case for why do they need to help you? Why do they, need, do they need to spend your time with you? And why do you think you have a better idea of what things can be done for the product more than they didn't for other products maybe, right? Sales, same story. Sales want to spend their time in the front line, talking to customers. Now you come up with this new product that nobody will know if it sells or not, right? You wanna convince the sales guys to go out and talk about it to learn about it, to read the sales collateral, to take the training, to talk to customers, right? If you're on a product like Fitbit and you have hardware, then you have a channel that you need to handle. This channel has maybe thousands of units of a previous version. What are they gonna do about it, right? Uh, you wanna price it at a certain point. The sales team is incentivized to sell more. Do you wanna discount? You wanna convince them not to discount, right? All of these are challenges that, as a product manager, you have to go through, right? You gotta work with legal. Right? What data are we capturing? Where are we keeping it? How long is it going to be there? Uh, what if the product tells the customer misleading information? What if it fails? Right? What's our warranty? 
policy, what's our replacement policy, all of these things are things that have to be let down. In our whole supply chain, right? Where are we sourcing materials from? Um, are we doing things locally? Are we getting from abroad? What's our cost target? What's our margin target? We work with finance. Like all of these things are things that you gotta go through before launching a product. Assuming you already went through the phase of defining what the product is. And the reason why I went through all of this is to explain that if you're the CEO, if you're that person on the left, you can just tell everybody, marketing, go do this. This is the message. We're going to price it at this price point. Nobody will argue with you. You're going to source this material from this supplier because we have a partnership. No questions asked. The salesperson, you're going to work on this product and drop everybody, everything else. No questions asked, right? The problem is that nobody's actually working for you here. You're this poor guy on the left where there's no lines connected, right? Nobody owes you anything. Nobody actually wants to spend some time working with you on this new stuff that you're coming up with. Because who knows, you might have a successful thing in the past, a failure thing, right? But you need to work across all of these functions, plus you still have a boss. So while coming up with a new product idea, trying to make an investment, you gotta talk to your boss and say, well, I convinced all of these people, and here's my case. Now your boss has to be convinced because they have to go convince their boss who needs to convince the CEO that this is a good investment for the company, right? So just wanted to make this distinction clear. If people try to portray the glamour of the job that you're the CEO, sorry, product managers are not CEOs of anything, it's a great job to do everything possible to make a successful product and it's very rewarding in that sense but it comes with a lot of challenges. And these challenges are all based on, not technically, right? Like you can get the technical part of a treaty is. This is the piece that it cannot be taught in a book or even in this session, right? It's just an expectation. This, this is what's needed in a, in a job or in that role and this is what you have to go through in everyday life. So when people ask me what's, can you define the job? This is my definition, right? It's a job where you have to make everybody work with you while no one is actually working for you, right? That's, that's the reality of it, and it's difficult in that sense. Which makes it very kind of developing, right? It helps you develop skills that you wouldn't have otherwise. It, it, it helps you work with people in a different way. It helps you learn how to negotiate, because like everything you're doing in the business is you're negotiating with people, right? You're trying to get things done while they don't necessarily need to be done, right? Um, it, 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 it builds resilience, right? Like you're not dealing with a technical problem that can be resolved over time or if you need or if you trial and error. You're working with people and like dealing with people is difficult, right? Um, so it, it needs stamina and it needs the person to be very action-based, like somebody has to be biased to action. Like you see a problem, you gotta go find a way to solve it, right? Um, so all of these things are challenges in the job, and I hope you'll appreciate that, okay, this is a good thing, not a bad thing, right? But it distills the glamour from the reality of the job, right? Um, so what is it about, right? So let's say like, we face all of these things, and then we're gonna talk about, okay, what is it that you actually do for the product? Now, I have my own perception, but this is what you'll find online, right? Like you search about the product manager, you look at the images, and you'll find people trying to describe it in this way, which is great. But in my own opinion, it's, it's a micro view of that world, right? It tells you that you gotta worry about user experience, because you gotta do what's right for the user, kind of breathe and, and dream and live what users need in the product, and try to give them the best they can in the, in the, in the most easiest and, and, and the, be the best way possible, right? You gotta be involved in technology. You gotta learn how to talk with engineers, learn what's happening in the market, what technologies to use, what's the process, how do you develop the product, software or hardware or a service, right? And then you gotta worry about how to make money, right? Like how to commercialize that product. I think this is a good view, but it's a bit a bit of a micro view. And I think I think that at least for me, it always represents the reality more, right? Because regardless of the technology, you can be working in a service industry that doesn't kind of deploy a lot of technologies, right? It might not be, technology might not be the biggest problem that you have. Um, user experience is mostly today described in the terms of the hardware and software facing, right? How do people feel and see about using the product? Well, again, in a service, might not be the case, right? Um, 
So I think, I think that might be another lens on the domain of the job. That this top left here, I think is the most important thing of all, right? Just you gotta be the, the person that can represent your customer the most. You gotta have this, this reputation in the business that nobody understands your customer better than you do for the product that you work on, period. This builds credibility, it builds trust, it makes people follow what you're trying to suggest as an idea, right? Everybody and their mother in the company will have an idea of what the product should do. And they'll tell you, well, this is what we need to do. Like, I've, I've been with a customer today and they told me to do this. You know, I was talking to the CEO and he said, this is a good idea. Everybody will have an idea. But nobody can challenge your path if you say, I did my research, I understand the customers, I talked to hundreds of them, and the majority are saying, this is the biggest problem we need to solve. A killer. Nobody can argue with that, right? And if they do, then they're probably in the wrong position. Second thing is the market opportunity. Because, again, there's this notion of just do what's right for the user, right? And then money will follow. I think that can work. It can work in maybe in, in some narrow domains if you're a startup. But in the vast majority of the businesses, you need to find a way to make money. End of story, right? Like, at one day, you got to make money. And the faster you know what the opportunity you're after is, the better you can think about, okay, how can we make money for using that product? Now, this idea in day one can be completely wrong, but it's an idea that you'll be working towards, that you're trying to prove and complete, and it might be proven wrong in the middle, and you gotta pivot and shift and do something else, but working without an end of mind that we need to make money at one point, I think is somehow misleading and can be the result of many failures. Now, the last thing is, again, you know, when you compare the product manager to a CEO, I think this is actually one of the points where this is an overlap, that you gotta look not only at the market opportunity and at the customer, but you need to look internally. What are we capable of as a company and as a team? Can we deliver what the problem is, uh, what the solution for the problem is, and can we actually act on this market opportunity? Do we have a channel? So I can come up with the best product in the world, do we today have a channel to go sell it? No, then we gotta solve that. Um, you know, do we have the engineers that can work on the technology that can make this product competitive? No, you gotta make a case to recruit engineers to work on this technology, right? So it's the intersection of these three, getting what the customer wants, knowing how can you make money, and whether you in the company can actually have the competencies to deliver what's needed to make money and create the product that solves the problem. I wouldn't spend a lot of time here, right? But really, that, that tells you, I don't think a day in the life of a product manager works. I don't think a week works. It's really like, you gotta look at a month or a year, right? And this is what happens. It's, it's a day where you gotta solve problems. Every day you have an issue, right? You have a customer complaining. You have a salesperson who like doesn't like what you're doing. You have a pricing discussion. You have if you're working over hardware, you have a supplier that suddenly has shortage of materials. Like, what do you do, right? An uh, export-import problem. Uh, you have a helpless person that screwed up with a customer. You gotta go solve that, right? All of these things are things that you worry about. Um, Cross-team planning, right? In many cases, your product cannot survive on its own. You gotta work with other product teams who live in the same dilemma. So they are trying to solve their own problem and make a case for their product to be successful. And now they gotta listen to you and give you bandwidth so that you can, they can help you get something done in your product, right? This is a very difficult discussion usually. Um, so how do you get over this and how can you plan it and how can you create the case for it? And it's all about creating incentive, right? It's, it's about making people see what do they stand to lose if they don't help and what do they stand to gain if they help. It's gonna be a mutual benefit, right? Um, partners meetings. Sometimes you can't get this product off the ground on your own. You're gonna work with partners. So what's the incentive that you have to work with you? What, why do they need to give you attention, right? Why do they have to be exclusive to you? How do you guarantee that you're gonna be working with you without exploiting your information and giving it to somebody else? Um, you know, working on your roadmap, um, reprioritizing stuff because the engineering team is working today and they tell you, hey, we're gonna deliver this in three months. Well, shit happens. They couldn't. Now we have to change. Do we change the timeline or do we change the scope? Right? So we gotta reduce what we need to go to market with if it's important to meet the date, 
or we're going to accept that we're going to stretch another quarter to release the product and lots of the consequences of that. Um, working on requirements, right? training the salespeople, especially in an enterprise world, when you're selling to enterprises, not to consumers, there is the whole thing about listening to the signals that's coming from the market. Did we win or lose certain accounts? If we win, why? If we lose, why? Right? And the question why and the questions what if is going to be the best friend, right? Like every situation, why and what if, why and what if, right? This, this is what helps build kind of this questioning um, culture and gets you to get to the root cause of things that otherwise might be taken for granted. And again, we can spend a lot of time on this in, in, at the second part of the discussion and the Q&A, and you can find this online, but again, it's, it's a mix of everything, right? So I'll transition and, and start talking about, this is not an advice, right? I cannot claim that I'm here to give you an advice on what you need to do or not do. I guess I'm just saying that out of being the job for a few years, I know that these are challenges, and these are challenges because you have to balance very competing and opposite things, right? Um, you're going to be very strategic, but also very tactical. Meaning, at any point of the product lifestyle, you're going to know where do you want the product to be in two years and three years. And again, the hypothesis you might have at the point might be completely wrong, but it might be the best hypothesis you have given the data you have at hand and the best assumption you can make at this point. And you go with that. And you've got to convince everybody that this is the best way forward. And you've got to listen to people's feedback to correct this path as you go. But you also got to be tactical because a lot of people that I've seen spend a lot of time thinking about this North Star, right? Okay, this is what we're going to be in three years. And this is what we'll do to get there in three years. But you forget the tactical part, which is, okay, great vision. Now, this quarter, next week, what are we going to do, right? What is it that we need to do now to fix the problem that we have at hand today? And then the transition between this and this is never ending, right? Because you execute a bunch of things today, you finish the quarter, you measure a bunch of things, and you find that, ah, oh, man, the, the strategy is not aligned. I mean, what we're doing doesn't help. Do we change our tactics, but the strategy still remains the same? Or what we're learning from the tactics every day tells us that the strategy actually needs to pivot a little bit, right? So this is an, like a never-ending battle. The second thing is um, reaching out and reaching in, right? Reaching out because, as I mentioned, you're the customer's best friend. You gotta be the advocate of the customer in the business, right? You gotta meet with them, sit with them, be in the front line, take the bullets when kind of you complain about the product. You gotta be there to say, yes, our mistake, we are corrected, right? Understand the problem, you're not solving the product. Um, working with partners, right? Working with governments, working with whatever, and then reaching in because the thing about getting people to help you in the company is not going to work unless you build rapport with these people on an ongoing basis. You always have to reach out and know who can help you when, right? You might get a lunch with a person or a coffee with another person that might not have to do anything with what you're doing today, but you know that, okay, you know, this person might need my help in the future or I might need their help in the future. Let me get familiar with what they do. Let me know what the job is about. What are the challenges that they have? How my product can help them? Let me get my feedback and the feedback and input, right? Um, and I cannot tell you how many, like it's countless times where this worked out in a way that I, was, I never expected, right? You meet a person one year and then the second year you find that they'll help you commercialize something you didn't even have in mind, right? Um, it's just important to keep this in mind. Um, we touched on this, but commercial versus technical. Again, very important to know how are we going to make money, right? Go to market strategy. Which markets? Which customer segments? And why? How do we charge? And, and, and what do we charge? And why? Do we go direct or indirect? And why? Right? Um, many of these questions will come to mind. And because many other people in the business will have ideas on how this needs to be done, but you're accountable for the success of the product, you need to go with a hypothesis. Like he, when, you, when you talk to every function, you gotta go say, this is what I think is right, based on the data that I have, the analysis that I've done, and this is my hypothesis and assumptions. Let's challenge it, right? But let's start there. Because otherwise, everybody will have a completely different direction on where to take this product to market. And the other thing is technically. So again, in, in, in the products where you have to be technical, you don't have to be as strong technically as in the engineers uh, the engineering team you have or working with, 
but you must be able to have smart discussions, intelligent discussions with the engineering team. Meaning, a new technology comes up, do we use it or no? Do we develop things on our own or do we make it, sorry, do we buy it or make it or partner to have it, right? The engineers will typically want to build stuff, but it might be a better decision not to build things and go partner and have it or buy it from, from another supplier, right? Uh, technical debt, you can say, well, you know, things that we've done in the past have to be corrected. You gotta listen to, okay, good or bad, now is a good time or later and why, right? Um, bugs, can you live with a bug or no? Right? Is this bug going to kill your product or people can live with it so that you can invest in something else? So many of these things require that you understand the underlying technology, the process that your team is using, what technologies are out there in the market, and, and, and try to have some intelligent discussion with the engineering team. Um, if, if there's a punchline here, I'd say that you got to tell something in two formats. you got to be able to convert an elevator pitch into a bedtime story if needed, right? So you have one thing that you want to convince everybody to do. When you talk to the CEO, it's going to be in 30 seconds. You wouldn't entertain listening to all of the great ideas you have. If you're working with your marketing team or sales team, elaborate, right? Talk about the details, talk about the how and why and when and where and so on. It's the same messages, the same context, the same objective, but you must be able to pivot and say, okay, the short version is X, Interested in the long version, it's why, right? Because know your audience. The, 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 the difference of the audience makes a difference in the message you want to tell in these things when you talk about your product and your business case and, and your roadmap and plans. Again, so no argument, right? Like data driven. Everybody kind of see this now and, and you know that everybody needs to be data driven. However, my challenge to that is in most cases, you don't start with the data. Like, you don't have data to start. You have a new idea, you don't have data, right? You have a new idea because you saw a problem in the market. Like, you, you tried to use something and it didn't work. Okay, that's a problem. Let me develop a product for or an idea to solve. Do we have data? No. So how to get the data is actually understanding the problems in your domain and building hypotheses, which is dealing with this part. If there's anything that actually helped me six or seven years back is that my first manager told me, and by the way, because I come from an engineering background, and I think that this will be a problem for everybody that comes from an engineering background and tries to get into this, is dealing with ambiguity, right? That we need data for every single thing. Like, we got to get more data. We're 80%, we're going to make it 90%. Now, I have two data points, let's get another two data points. No, it's not going to work this way. Data is limited, right? At one point, it's ambiguous. We have to deal with ambiguity, use it, develop a hypothesis with the best assumption we can, given our understanding of the problem and the customer and the market, and go with it. And while we're going and developing stuff, we're going to capture more data and measure and see if we need to correct our path. But just waiting for more data, this never-ending story of, like, we want to get more data, is, is not going to be helpful. And I've lived through the nightmares of this. I've lost opportunity because of it. Um, and I just can't stress how, how this is kind of sometimes very important to deal with, right? Um, when you saw me talking, I think I was going more into the stubborn path. Like, you got to pitch your case, you know, make your case to your team uh, mates and explain why your path is the best one. I think it has a limit and it's difficult to draw the boundary, right? Because as much as you want to be stubborn on your vision and your strategy and where you want to go, there's a point where you got to take people's input and be flexible, right? I cannot explain when. Why? How? I cannot claim that I'm actually good at it. I, I, I make a lot of mistakes in that area. Um, but it's something that I guess people develop as you go, right? Like I'm learning now that this is something I have to get better at. Um, when to change path based on people's input? When can you accept that, okay, maybe my opinion is not the best? Basically, the punchline is pick your battles, right? You don't want to be stubborn every case. Just pick your battles. See where do you want to be stubborn so that you can make your case. and. When can you be flexible so that people can actually give you credit for, for listening to them? And I think the overall, as if, if I would conclude anything, is going to be this is the life, right? This is, this is the life of product managers. It's not a CEO, right? It's, this noise is everybody around you and their opinions and their ideas of what needs to be done in every area of the product and why at all the time. And your job 
is to find a way to find this line in the middle, right? Like, no, this is all noise. Thank you, great idea, but no valid concern, but we'll look at it later, right? And explain why what you chose as the path is the best way forward out of all the noise that's happening around you. And the problem here is that you want to establish buy in, right? So you found the path. Like you have, you've, you've done your research, you've looked at the data, you talked to the customer. Now you have to go back internally and pitch your ideas and vision to everybody that you're working with and get the buy in so that they can support you in whatever you're trying to do, right? So, great question. I don't know if I have a good answer for this, right? The, the, the thing here is that I think it very heavily depends on where you are in that product journey. If you're very early on, you're working on a strategy. Um, I'm sure, did, every, did everybody hear the question, by the way? Yeah? Okay. So, I think if, if, if you're early on, you have a lot to prove. The product's still in early stages. The market opportunity is huge, and you're trying to focus on a 10% win. Yes, that question might be valid. And then the question would be, I think, if you go back here, this is why this is important, right? Because the bigger the opportunity, the bigger this share has to be, right? Do we have the competencies, right? Can we actually develop a sales force that can go tackle 500 customers instead of 10 or 20, right? Um, can we work on 10 features at a time instead of two? Like all of these are questions. So there are things that have to do with execution. Can we execute faster and bigger? That's a scale question. But sometimes it's about timing. So how can we make it 10 times better if we haven't even proved to be one step better? Like if I'm launching a new product, right? Or if the product is like one year and I have market penetration of 2%, have I actually proven enough that my product is worth the investment that will get us 10 folds? Maybe yes, maybe no, right? So I think there's no like binary answer to this. It's the collection of this. How big is the opportunity? What's the total available market? How can we address that market today based on our competencies? And what's the need that we're after, right? Maybe you expand the customer needs. Maybe you're focusing on one problem, you're gonna focus on four, right? So it's, it, there's no binary answer. Um, and again, just, Capitalizing the question, the, the purpose of this line definitely wasn't to show the growth. It's just to show that, like, distilling the noise, right? Like, we're we're looking at what's important out of all of these things. Um, I'm sure you've seen this, right? But to distill this noise, you gotta say what's better for the customer, and eventually people will realize that if it's better for the customer, it's better for the product, then you can make money, right? If if you're doing something because it's better for the CEO's opinion, because you want to kind of you know, address his concern or, or her concerns or, uh, or your sales team, what I usually call is the, there's something you, if you're familiar with, they call the voice of customer, right? Voice of customer is going out and getting the customer input, consolidating this feedback and data points, come back with a view that summarizes that and synthesizes the information to say, out of all of this, the direction is whatever, right? Now, what I used to call the voice of last customer, which is in an enterprise domain, the salesperson is coming back to you saying, I was just meeting this customer and they say, do you want X, Y, and Z in the product? Great, that's one data point, that's one customer. I'll take your input, but that's not gonna make or break the product. We cannot change path because of the voice of one customer, right? Um, and you'll find many of these examples all the time. So noise, find a straight line, 
find the reason why people will be convinced what you're saying is best for your customers, and then it's going to be best for the product, right? Um, last, I'm not saying it is very rewarding, right? I want to be cautious. It can be very rewarding. At points, it can be very disappointing. At points, it can be very challenging. Uh, you can have a good idea that ends up being a disappointing product. You can have a great product that might be a disappointing launch. You can have a great launch just for a competitor to come and crush you, right? Like it's, it, it's not 100% a positive world, right? It's very challenging. But once you have a product um, that launches and you find people giving you feedback, hey, this is a great product, then it's very rewarding, right? And you'll find this not just because of pro being a product manager. Like if in day-to-day -day life, I think, if you do something that can help someone and that person thanks you, it's rewarding. That's this on steroids, right? Um, I think that's the last thing I have. Yeah. Um, how, how much time do we have? Two questions if you'd like. like ask a couple questions. We have about like 10, 15 minutes to do some questions and have dialogue, and then we'll open it up to legally amongst each other. Sure. How uh, is a day, a normal day in your life? What do you do when you get to the Right. Um, what I do is that first I block three hours of my calendar so that I can know how to do work. And because the rest is usually meetings. Like people call you, you get escalations and so on, right? But I think, so if there are very simply like maybe two sides to this, right? So the side of, sure, sorry. The, the question was like, what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Like when you get to the office, what do you do, right? In a single day. Um, I think, Let's, let's simplify it and say you're working on one product, right? Because you might be working on multiple. If you're working on one product, and in that product you are in the planning phase, like you're trying to see where this product should go, what's the idea, and so on, I think most of your time is between market research. You're trying to understand what's out there in the market that can do what you're trying to do. The second part is going to be talking to customers and doing just this type of research to understand what's the feedback, what's the most important thing you need to solve. And third is working on this strategy. Okay, so like if I do this, how do I make money out of it, and so on. I think that's that's if you're an early stage in the product. Now, if you're down to execution and you're actually developing the product or launching it and so on, it becomes the firefighting case. So you're less now on strategy and planning and all of this stuff. Like this is basically 10% of what you need to think about. The rest is firefighting, customer escalations, right? Launches that gone wrong, bugs that have to be resolved. Uh, partners that you had to work with. So it's basically calls, 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 and meetings, and, and meeting with team to see why things are not going on, tr um, on track, why things are delayed or not, how can you go faster, and so on. So I think that's, if you look at it binary on a one product scale, that's that's the split, right? Yep. Sure. Um, so I, I would avoid talking about products at Google at this point, but I can tell you examples of my previous employers, right? Um, and I'll pick one of the most challenging parts. So in one of my previous companies, I was working, it's a manufacturing company, right? Um, and it does equipment for gas stations. Um, and I was working on IoT product. So basically, how can we connect these things that have been sitting at the ground in the field for 20 years to a cloud-based system so that we can gather data and kind of start making more money off of software in this manufacturing business. Now, the business case is actually very straightforward, right? So we knew how to make money. Actually, we knew this for like 10 years ago. We just couldn't execute, right? So customers have kind of validated our input 10 times over. We know that they will pay money. We know what is needed to develop the product. We did the planning and we started working on the product. Everything was going very kind of rosy, right? Which is like, this is a straightforward, like now we can execute, we can make money. Now what happened is we forgot that we are trying to connect 20 years old equipment to the internet, right? And you gotta assume that the infrastructure is there, right? Like every, every business has internet right now. No, like many of these gas stations didn't have robust internet. Those of them that had to, like had internet, they didn't want to disrupt their business so that we can go ask them, can you get on a trial with us? Like, can we go install all of these hardware plugins and your dispensers and your fuel site so that we can get data, so that we can show you the software? So when people came to actually executing this, 
just like, hold on, like good story, when you prove the product, come to me, sell it, I'll pay. But I don't want to be part of the trial because like this is so much disruption for my business, I cannot take it, right? So the, the second aspect of this is that, and again, not underestimating the, the, the skills of anyone, right? But the, the technical field, the field technicians that work in that industry have seen these products as they are for the last 20 years. They have not been advancing technologies, right? So suddenly we're coming to the same team and saying, here's all of this complex stuff, right? Connect routers, configure, you know, uh, routing rules and like get us measure the signal that you are at the site and all of this stuff. And then that became unrealistic. Like we didn't take this into account. We assume that, okay, it's 20, uh, 2017 or 2016, like everybody has this, but you go to the field and you want this team now to help you do this and the skill is not there. And no matter how, how much you write documents, right, people are not gonna read 40 page documents to know how to install a hardware plugin, right? So the, the, the fact that we didn't take into account that we've done what's right for the user, we've done what's right for us, but we haven't done what's right for the people that have actually deployed it in the field, that was a, a disaster, right? So that, that was one lesson that we learned. Um, and I guess, let me capitalize, because this is an important point. So you have, maybe on a high level, you have software products, hardware products, and service products, right? It can be very easy to get off the ground with a service product because it takes much smaller investment and trials to say, can I actually prove that this service would help? You know, it's, it's easy to find a manual way to do it, go talk to people and help them do it and see if it actually helps, right? Software is second easiest uh, because it takes work. It takes you know, graphics work, it takes software engineering work, it takes infrastructure, deployment, process, word of mouth, reach, marketing, right? But when it comes to hardware, and if, if anybody gets into hardware, the equation is completely different. It's, it's that complexity, again, on steroids, because now you bring in two things, supply chain and manufacturing, and that changes the equation, right? Supply chain means you need to work with very concrete cost targets. You gotta know how to develop uh, supplier relationships. You gotta have an inventory, like you gotta take the cost of that inventory. Shipping this thing out, you have to work with trucks, distributors, channel, like, the manufacturing line, again, manufacturing is a very difficult skill. It's very old and people have it, but it's not easy to replicate it, right? So again, going to hardware is just, it adds much more complexity to the story. So I think just when launching hardware products, the, the things that you gotta take into account is, are things that are not easily replicated or learned in a software business. So, um, question, that's a very good scenario. How do you resolve the conflicting priorities uh, when you get to a point where you have a scenario A that customers are already using your product and say that I need these three features and I'm only going to renew the license with you guys if I get these three features at like $7 million. You have a customer B who has promised to give you a contract of $8 million, they're not your customer yet, and they're saying we need three, three features and you're going to do that. you got a compliance in place that if you don't put those three features, then you're gonna be in compliance and you, there will be penalties on your product. And then there is four features, there's a cost of DK. And if you don't release it right now, then of course the cost is gonna go down and they would go, there would be of no use you can sell the money. How do you work in that kind of situation? Sure, so great, great question. So let me add to this, right? I'm not, I'm sure everybody heard the question, right? Now, you're gonna add regulatory rules. You know, security compliance changes, you gotta to respond to that, right? You gotta add technology obsolescence. Technology is going out of time and like you cannot use it and you find no support like when do you make a decision into that right um, there's more variables and I think there are two ways to look at this one is to subjectively and this will always change right have a balance in your roadmap and your engineering bandwidth to say look this is the market opportunity are we after the market opportunity or after the smaller customers that will renew because we have X number of customers and they represent 10% of our revenue, while we want to go after 80% that are not served yet, I'll probably dedicate 20% of my roadmap to serve ad hoc customer requests. So big customer comes screaming at me, I always have 20% in my bandwidth to say, let's respond to that, right? Same thing as technology obsolescence, technical debt. You kind of say, okay, starting this year, 10%, 20%, 10%, 50% is new features. Now, 
This might change, and it will change, and it should change, right? But the fact that you started with a hypothesis that this is a good enough balance, and that is based on data and assumptions you've seen based on studying your market and your customers and your future plans, that's the starting point that can help you come back in the middle of the year and say, well, things have changed. Let's look at the assumptions we've made and see which one can we compromise, right? Now, that can be different, again, based on the stage you are in the product. If it's very early, your source of revenue and source of growth are customers. So you got to be able to respond to customers and respond fast so that we can give you the feedback you need and help you develop a product, right? That can be much more valuable at one point than what you think is the strategy for the product and what the new features are. If you're at one point where you're actually growing, right, and your obstacle is not solving one problem for one customer or two, your problem is how can I find bandwidth to go after the 50% in the market that I'm not yet tackling in my opportunity. I think in that case, again, using data and assumption, you can say, well, we're after this big stuff, one customer is not gonna hurt, right? You're gonna talk to that customer and say, we're doing this to the product, let's sign an NDA, I'm gonna tell you what our roadmap is, your concern is valid, point taken, but we cannot do it now, we do it at that point in the future, what can we do meanwhile, right? And I think, very easily said, hardly done, if your product is delivering true value to the customer and they find it difficult to get away from it, these threats are super pushing in most of the cases. No customer will say, if you don't give me this feature, I'm not going to renew. Like, it's very rarely, actually, when some customers stop renewing because of a feature request, because the product is really adding value. If the product is marginal, then yes, the switching cost is, is, is low, but that comes back to the strategy. So why did we build a product where the switching cost is low, right? So you gotta take it into account to say, well, when we're doing something, how can we be sticky? How our product can be just day and night is what the customer is using, and when they come to switch, they find it difficult, and difficult for good reason, right? So, sorry, this was questioning, sir. So. Uh, how much value do you give to competition? Uh, you do the competition during the market research and analysis. But at the later stage in your product, how much uh, importance are you giving or are you observing competition to change features? Right. In, in my book, it's very small. Uh, in my book, it's, it's the customer. So here's the thing. Your competitors can be adding bills and whistles and gimmicks left and right because they're bigger, they're faster, they're whatever. It doesn't mean that you're adding the right stuff. When you should be worried, is that when you start listening to growing feedback from the customer saying, hey, my three problems have not been addressed and your competitors are solving these problems. That's when it becomes worrying. That's when you say, well, why are they better? But the root cause here, if you dig into it, is that you haven't listened to your customer, right? So if you're always working towards finding the right solution for a customer problem, I personally don't worry about competition, and I don't worry about them in the sense of what feature are they developing and why, right? That, that doesn't get me worried. What gets me worried is when I worry about competition because of commercialization stuff. They're discounting the product. How can we respond? Like, they are opening for a customer segment or a channel that we're not after. How can we be as fast as them, right? This is the stuff that I take into account and I look at seriously. But on a feature comparison and how can we in parity with competitors, that, that doesn't usually come into play, right? Mentioning listening to the customers, I'm wondering, like, you're making all these different assumptions, like, you know, across the board and you don't have blind quality. You have a lot of customers, not that for you all. Right, so the, the question is, is like, when you have a lot of customers, how can you actually talk to them all? Because you'll never be able to talk to a large number of customers and get all the feedback. So this is where I think the role of, if you're a big company, you have market research, and if you're a small company, you have your gut feel and your sales channel and your relationship with customers. And then what needs to happen here is, again, the hypothesis. It starts with customer segmentation, right? So how can we segment our customers into the three areas that might be demographics, right? Might be based on the commercialization objectives. It might be, which what I prefer personally, is need-based, meaning let's look at every customer segment on the problems that they need and how can we meet this unmet, how can we solve this unmet need, right? And by segmenting your customers, you can layer multiple levels of that segmentation based on a hypothesis, and you're going to verify this, right? 
But then you have these segments, you gotta choose, okay, which segment is actually more profitable to me? Where are the most problems that I can solve? And you can focus on that segment. When you look at a certain segment, you gotta start narrow down the segment into a short list of customers. Like who are the most customer, that let's say tech savvy customers that we can talk to because we need valid input. Or who are the customers that have never used our solution but they've used a competitor solution so that we can learn how they solve the problem, right? Um, so I think that's, that's one thing, like narrowing down based on segmentation and a hypothesis who is a good customer to talk to is one thing, because you're right, you're never gonna talk to all customers, especially in a business-to-business -business domain. In, in a consumer, it might be easy, you're gonna like run a survey, you get millions of respondents, right? But in a business-to-business -business or an enterprise world, it's much more difficult to get customer input. Actually, it's much more difficult to get two things. One, bandwidth, so that they can, the customer actually can spend time with you to tell you, okay, here's my problem. It might be the fifth time I tell you this, and they get bored because we told you and you never fixed it. Uh, but the second thing, it might be difficult actually to get to the right stakeholder inside that business, because who do you want to talk to now? Is it a finance person? Because it's, it's a financial product. Or is it uh, like a, a product line, like somebody on the manufacturing line, because you're helping something automate the manufacturing line? Do you want to talk to the person that has the problem, or the person that is going to buy the product? So somebody's going to influence the decision, or somebody's going to make the investment, right? Um, and I think in large companies, this is where things like market research comes in, right? You can kick off many of these projects uh, by identifying customer segments and a hypothesis of what you need to go after, and then you shortlist. And then it's, it's, it's an iterative process, right? The key. One, you don't stop talking to customers. Like you start, you talk to 100, you get feedback, you start working, you get something out, you go out and verify, you wanna to talk to the same 100 again, or like pick another 100 that you haven't talked to, right? It's an iterative process. Uh, the product itself, right, now, it has a different mission altogether. Um, for a company, say for example, like the company wants to maybe diversify their portfolio. They may be going to a new market or nobody is not there in the you know, segment. They want to create a new product. So that is one aspect company wants to go for a new generation of the revenue. The other aspect is uh, we have a customer and the, our competitor has a new product, right? So new product in the existing segment and uh, our customer asking, we don't have product like this, I'm using and seeing the benefit. So in order to go for that, you need to go for a, this kind of a competition environment where how to deal with that kind of new product in the existing segment. So how you do the analysis or come up with the product on these two segments? It could be like both are in a different uh, addressing segment. Right. So, how do you do that? so let, let me play it back to make sure I got the question right. The question is, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that if you have two decisions to make, one is gonna go after a completely new green area, green field, like big opportunity you haven't tackled before, you can make money there, you don't have a product. And the other thing is that you're serving existing install base of customer, somebody of your competitors is tackling these customers, providing a value that you can't, and you're gonna address that problem. So which one do you go after? Is, is this right? Yeah, no, I assume that you are doing that too, too. So how do you deal with, I mean, how do you analyze and how to go to the market? These two situations. Right, so I think the, the question is very broad, right? So it's, it's comparing apples to oranges. So if, if it's a new green field, right? Once, I, I guess it starts by, you actually wanna make that decision to go in, same in the same direction or in both directions at the same time. If you're a large enough company and you have the resources to go, that I guess that that's decision is behind this, right? Um, but otherwise, you're gonna make the hard decision, you go here, here or there, right? But once you made that decision, I think it's just about, I don't know, it's like, it's just finding the right team and find resources to, to go research that area, understand how big is the opportunity here, research that area, understand how big is the opportunity there, and then based on the size of the opportunity and the impact that it can make on your business on the long term, you assign how many people should be working here and should be working here, right? Not sure if I addressed your question, but I'm, I'm like I'm just not sure I captured it accurately, right? So we, we can talk about it, I guess, maybe in the Q and A session, right? Yeah. Um, so say you're working on a very technical project or a technical product, and you come across a problem that is very challenging in your background. Um, I'm sure you see this more often in Google. So probably sort of seeking your advice or seeking your experiences if you've had any is. Um, you're having a hard time sort of getting by on the engineering lead or the engineering hard part, um, but you know behind the scenes that you know, technically something is possible. 
how do you sort of manage that relationship and also manage the egos and just kind of make sure the product is Right. Okay. So the question is if if you're working with an engineering team, strong engineering team, we have, I guess, let me make sure I also play it back right, right? And that engineering team has their own view of how things should be done or why things should be done. And these views might not correspond to yours, but you have a strong technical background that can challenge what they're saying. How do you manage this? Is, is this a good, okay. Yeah. Um, so, again, easier said than done, but I think it boils down to, okay, Will the customer be served in a better way if I do it your approach or my approach? It, it really boils down to that question. And the, the problem is not that this is the fact. The problem is that how is that conversation going? So what data does each team have to prove that this is better for the customer? And again, you know, I'm sure you all know this, right? But life is a game of incentives. And working in a corporate culture is a game of incentives. Everybody has an incentive to do something. The engineering team has an incentive to do complex stuff uh, or to do things on an on-time basis, like something has to launch every quarter, whatever, right? Or do uh, get a promotion, all right? The sales team is incentivized to go close a certain amount of quota that they are after, right? Nobody cares about anything, that the incentive comes first. And I think in many cases, teams find it difficult to think macro, so what's better for the company and the business versus what's better for me and my team, right? Because the incentive is misaligned. But coming back to your question, I think it boils down to understanding the other team's incentive. See, what do they need to accomplish? Like, are they telling you that we would like to do it by redesigning the entire back-end component because that will give them a great design document that they can write and they get promoted? <coughs> or do you really have a great perspective on why this can be better for the customer than yours? Because you know, your idea might work in, a, in one quarter, but these think that on, on the long run is going to be disastrous. Like, we're going to resolve it now instead of spending time on it later. I don't know, right? Um, so that conversation is difficult. It's, it's difficult to have. And it's difficult to sway people from certain directions, especially if it plays against an incentive that somebody has. But trust me, when, when, when I say I've been through this multiple times, it's if you're able to be the customer advocate, and if you're able to portray the customer problem in a way that nobody else can, and the people trust you actually know the customer more than they do, that conversation usually is much easier. Because even if you reach a point of no agreement, if it becomes a consensus or an escalation, the view where the customer wins always kind of gets the priority, right? Can you just talk about effectively about service and software? So do you think how from a hardware product manager to a software product manager and the other way around. Right. Um, the question is, if the other side of here is, how transferable are the skills of the product manager between a hardware product manager and software product manager and the other way around? I think if you, um, like, if, if, even if I look at, at this deck, which I, I purposely try to do agnostic of the technology, I think many of the things we talked about today are agnostic of its hardware, software, or service. Many of the challenges and the processes and the conversations that you have and the skills you need to develop and like the way you get things done in a business, I think are absolutely the same. What gets different is when you look at the, uh, if I go back, um, if you look at the intersection between the market opportunity, the customer need, and the organization competencies, I think this is entirely transferable. Like you, you do it multiple times, you learn it, you can take it into any type of business, it doesn't change. You can tweak it left and right, there are things that can be different. But the majority, if you follow the 80-20 rule, the 80 will be there. It gets different here, right? Because that part becomes entirely different. If you have, if you're, and, and I've been through this, I've been in software like in the first seven or eight years of my career, and then I got into a product management job for hardware. I kind of lost track for six months. And people who are sitting there discussing things and have no idea what they're saying. Talking supply chain problems like, why is this important, right? Like, like what's difficult about this? Uh, people, you know, tell you about managing SKUs, right? In a manufacturing business, you have like thousands of SKUs. And because you're thinking software, it's like, so what? It's all in the database. Like, what's difficult about this? No, it's difficult because now when you translate these SKUs and SKUs for people who don't know it, it's like basically the part number, right? When you translate all of these thousands of part numbers into 
20 products that the customer wants to buy, and how do you package them differently? How do you communicate it? How do you develop documentation for it? How the production line and the hardware business changes to cater for all of these changes in the product configuration? It just doesn't click, right? So I think this is when it becomes difficult that the technology or that the execution piece of the technology of the product is really what what can be, it's not transferable. Like you gotta learn it for each of these parts, right? But the majority of the job I think is, is really the same. The question is, if you want to get a product management job at Google, uh, what skills do you want to have? Again, uh, it, it's, it's hard to answer this based on my own personal opinion in this discussion, but I'll tell you what you can find online, right? The product management jobs at Google, and I think many successful companies at Google, um, are about three things mainly, right? Um, are you able to think strategy? Right? Can you think of product strategy and like make hypotheses and kind of distill go to market um, plans and explain why you go in a certain direction and why? Um, the second thing is execution and people skills. Like, can you actually get in a discussion with somebody? And there's this technical skills. And I say when a technical skill is required, um, I doubt, I personally doubt that a company who wants to hire a product manager, unless it's a product manager for a very specific niche product or technology that somebody needs to hit the ground running and just make insightful feedback in the day we start. If you just need a smart, good, capable product manager that can work on the long term on many products, the technical skill that you have is just having the foundation of understanding the engineering background of the type of things you're doing. If you're working on software, you don't have to understand all types of SQL databases or NoSQL databases. You've got to understand databases, right? If you're working in web, you don't have to understand all the web frameworks out there. You just need to understand very high level, like how web technology works, what are the challenges, what are the components involved, right? The, again, that's my opinion. I think that's, that's something you find across many companies, not just Google, right? And the only caveat to this rule is, for example, like the hardware question, you want to get into, let's say, Apple, and you're going to be like an iPhone, like a product manager in the iPhone product line, you haven't done hardware product management before, and you're gonna want to join a team who wants to launch a product a year from now, okay, might be a challenge, right? Because that job or that role at this point of time might need a skill that's proven that people can just come apply right away, right? So again, it's probably like the 80-20, like 80% 20, 20 exceptions, 80% is the general case, right? Right. Uh, again, the question is, if I'm early in the product management career, what, what sort of advice is there that can help, right? Um, it's, it's, I don't know, I don't know where to start, to be honest, right? Like, um, I think if you split it on a high level again into two parts, one is the technical skills of the job, which is how to develop a product roadmap, how to write specs, how to crunch numbers so that you can come up with a financial model. Like all of these things are technical skills, right? Um, I think these are the short term skills. These are the skills that you can learn fast, iterate on, get it, run with it, and you can just repeating these skills every day. So I would say get this done by, right? Like see what your weakness is in that area. And if you're a product manager who's heavily involved in commercialization, focus on how to kind of cover the technical skills there and get it done with. I think what you need to focus on is the majority of what we spoke about here. If you're not good at networking, start networking, right? Start talking to people, start in reaching out, develop your network inside your business, inside your company or team, company and outside the company, right? That can help, that can help in the long run. Um, if you don't know how or if you don't find, which, which I think a problem that I had and I mentioned, if, if you find it difficult to deal with ambiguity, just get in these discussions. Like sit in a meeting that you don't understand and try to come up with some assumptions and validate it to people. Like, does this make sense or no, right? Um, 
the third element, which again, you know, I've, I've lived in it multiple times, is can you present your idea to different audiences, right? Have a product pitch idea in your on your mind, or a go to market plan that, or or a new product feature you want to develop and you want to discuss the value proposition for it. Take it, sit with multiple audiences, sit with your engineering team, sit with the marketing, with sales, with other teams, with people senior than you are, and see, can you deliver the pitch effectively, right? I think these are areas, like, alongside the things we discussed today are our thing to focus on, because that's what can be transferable, first. That's what takes longer to pick up, and that's what can actually label you for the long term and keep developing, not, not just the technical skill you can learn in, in a course or something, right? Right. So here's the thing. I, you know, I apologize for repeating myself, but I really cannot stress how important is this, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll position it differently this time. But understanding the product is great, but a lot of people can't understand the product. I think if you're new to a product that is established, to a company that is robust and stable, in a growing business that you want to add incremental value on, I think the first thing that you need to do if, if you're joining that team is get on a call with every salesperson you can reach or every partner you can reach out to and tell them, when is your next customer meeting and can I join you? Really, get in that front line, sit in front of customers, introduce yourself. Hey, I'm the new product manager for this thing. What do you think? What's your feedback? What are your complaints? Right? We're trying to solve this problem this way. Does this align with your business? This is our roadmap if we have an NDA. This is our roadmap. Does this fit your expectation? No. Why? Right? I'd say that really the, the most important thing is just get in that front line and tag along in every customer discussion you can get in. Nothing can be more valuable. So the question, if you're, if you're working on a product or your product manager for something for an internal product and you want to switch to a, an external facing product, um, again, I, I don't think there's difficulty doing this. I think the, if, if you can prove that you can tackle these points, um, if you have a good sense of talking about customer problems, if you've got a sense of understanding the market, summarizing your hypothesis of what the problem is and how to solve it, have good ideas on understanding the challenges of what your business is doing to go to market and commercialize things, um, how your business is making money, and how can you contribute to these ideations, um, whether you're internal, external, an outsider, I, I don't think really it makes it makes a lot of difficult. But just just make sure that these points are answered, right? When, when the product is internal product, I think I don't think that I think the only difference is that you don't think about commercialization. Like you don't think how to make money out of it because it's internal. You might think how to save money out of it. That's the only difference. But the rest is really the same. Working with teams, getting buy-in, prioritizing stuff, making decisions that might be right or wrong, and changing and pivot along the way. I think all of this is the same. The only thing is, well, we're not going out to customers with it to sell. We're maybe trying to do it so that we can build internal efficiencies or streamline processes or save money or cost and so on. Yes. Right. The question is, you know, as most people here are from engineering background, and you want to switch to product management. Kind of what are the top three skills or areas to focus on, right? Um, I would say spend. It's the same advice I just I just gave. I think first and foremost, start spending time 
on the sales and the marketing side. Sit in these meetings. If your team or if your business runs a sales funnel call every month, where they review the funnel, see what customers to go after, what opportunities to, opportunities to go after, what opportunities to drop and why, sit in these meetings, understand like how we think about making money, right? Um, if you have customer briefings or customer meetings, let's say a customer is coming in to sit with your product manager or to sit with your sales guy or with your CEO or whatever, it depends on the size of the company, of course, right? And these customer or customers are coming to your place or going to a conference um, so that you can brief them on what you're doing or they can brief you on the problems that they have as to be in these meetings. But can I sit and listen, right? This will help you get a sense of what's needed commercially and product-wise in your business to make something successful, right? And I think that is far and beyond more important than any other technical skills like I mentioned, right? Um, the, the, the second or the third thing that you can focus on, which actually I encourage the engineering team I work with to do is, when you look, for example, at a PRD, or a, like a requirement document, or a bunch of stories in Jira or whatever, um, I think many of the engineers I worked with in the past, not to criticize anyone, but the angle, the look at the stories, the requirements is, okay, let me just think how to do it. I think there's a different angle, which is, let me think about why we're doing it and go challenge the product manager on this, right? So go look at it and say, why is this important? Like, why, why are we not doing this story instead of that? Or like, why are we prioritizing this one versus this one, right? And start voicing your opinion on why things might be different. You might be right or wrong, but I think that get, gets that discussion going, right? Um, what else? Um, I think it, it depends on how open the culture of the place you're in at. Um, come up with your own ideas, write a document to describe what they are, go pitch them, right? There's no better way to develop a skill than actually applying what you need to learn. And there's no better way to validate if you can fit or are you going in the right direction to develop the skills better than actually trying to go challenging yourself to do it, right? So if you're an engineer, again, in, in many companies I've seen, it's a very open culture that somebody has a good idea, nobody can question why the idea is good, where is it coming from. As long as the idea is good and discussed in a well-designed or defined format, and it helps the business, it's well listened to. So I think just put your head together, write a document to describe, this is a problem we need to solve, this is why, this is how it can make us more successful, and go discuss it with people, right? So let me let me challenge the question. So the question is like, okay, this is maybe good or bad, but this is an advice you're giving for something you can apply within your own company. What about other companies? And actually, I'll challenge your question and say, if you haven't done it in, in a company that you currently work for and understand the business and have access to the product, what can make it successful if you try to do it for somebody else instead, right? I would say you have much better chances getting this developed and done in the place you're at, regardless of how big or small or different it is, than trying to step outside and say, okay, I'm going to switch my career. Let me just go for, find a company that can take me as a product manager, right? Everything is possible, but I think there's much more chances developing the skills and proving the point in your company versus trying to do it outside. And again, of course, any, anything I say here is, is possibly, like, can most likely can be wrong, right? So. Yes. Where is your inspiration? Like, what books are you reading right now, or like, what's your favorite app besides Google? Right. Um, <laughs> I'm not reading a lot of these things. <laughs> the question is like, what what am I reading, or like, what I have I read before, or what is my favorite app? So, I don't know. So look, I'll tell you the truth. I tried when I first got into product management. I tried to read a bunch of books, and I actually. Like I went to Amazon and I downloaded like seven or eight books. I read one, right? And I just midway through, I figured that, okay, blah, 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 blah. Theory, 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 theory. Like nobody's telling, telling me what do I need to do today. Nobody's telling me any of these things, like you're gonna face these things and how to deal with them. And even if they're telling you, okay, it's like 20% of what I need to do. And I found actually in this type of job versus like I've done engineering in the past, the less I read, and the more I just put myself and take a bullet because I've done something stupid, 
what I learned from it actually proves much more valuable. So if you're asking what I'm reading with, with regards to the job in general and the business, I'm telling you I'm reading very little. I'm just, you know, uh, uh, my, my, my reading is usually more in, like, in business and economy and so on. I like, try to educate myself in these areas and what's happening in technology, like look at TechCrunch and stuff like that. But that can cont contribute maybe like 5% to the knowledge you're building for the job or, or your career. Um, but I really believe that reading about this particular part of job is, is very is very difficult. And, and in my opinion, it cannot be very helpful. It can be helpful if you're looking at a certain technical skills. You're trying to learn more about what the UX team is doing. So you got to learn some of the UX lingo, see what design patterns are they using, why, what's happening, so that you can have a conversation, right? Um, yeah. Something you kind of addressed before, but let's say you're working on a new product that is completely transformational. You can't really go talk to the current customers because all they're thinking about is what is the next little incremental change to make to, to give me what I need. How do you gather information, market data, something like that? Blackberry to iPhone, right? I mean, there's something very transformational, and how did anybody know that was going to exist? Right. So, so that, that comes back to, I think, uh, uh, this. Because you don't have data, right? It's ambiguous. In many cases, you don't have access to data. All what you have in your possession is a bunch of good hypotheses that you develop because you didn't wake up with the hypothesis. It's like you've seen it happen over time with people, with customers. You've seen a problem and you're like, okay, I think I have a solution for this. And the only way to avoid actually to be successful going in a certain direction if you don't have data in such a place is experimentation. You, you know, find if you can pitch your idea in a way that makes sense because it can ring a bell and click with many people that, oh yeah, this is a problem we can solve. I think the first step, if you can get enough buying that people can give you investment to experiment, I think that's the best way to attack, to attack it, right? Um, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any advice for people who want to be a PM and that person doesn't have any engineering background? Um, PM without having any engineering background? Um, I would say because 80% of the skills apply whether you're an engineering job or a product that is built with you know hardware or software or no. I'd say try to find a job in a service business. Businesses like, you know, and I'm just giving examples like HelloFresh or like Blue Apron, right? That's a service business, right? Um, Uber, it's a service business. It's built on top of like many technologies, right? But a big part of the job doesn't actually require a technology, right? Uh, so finding a product or a business that's focused on a service where you can actually apply the majority of these skills and have like successful development of your commercial and, and people and like negotiation skills, and then make your way through technology, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Again, a lot of people will take you in a product or in a business, and I've seen as my, my colleagues have done that, is they don't have a lot of engineering background, and they have came because they have a freaking good commercial and sense and a good way to explain things to people, right? You can make, you can see problems, you can look at data and analyze data, you can pitch ideas, they can, you know, talk to customers, they can prioritize problems and execute and tackle them. Like, these are all skills that are hardly found, right? Um, and I've seen people get hired because of these skills only, not because they have any idea on the engineering side of the product they're in. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 